Hello and welcome back to Human Evolution. Today we want to talk about cancer. The first thing we want to talk about is what is cancer, right? It's a class of malignant diseases, but what they all have in common is that you have uncontrolled cell growth, right? The cells proliferate in an unrestricted manner, okay? This forms a tumor abnormal cell growth, okay? And a tumor is a collection of cells that actually have no function. And tumors come in two types. There are benign tumors and there are malignant tumors. The malignant tumors are the cancer tumors. Um, a benign tumor remains where it forms. It doesn't mean that tumors can't cause problems, even if they're not malignant. I mean, they can. Um, but really, the key to a malignant tumor is that it can spread to other tissues, right? And so little pieces will break off, and it will establish itself at a new site. Now, what causes this? Well, cancer is caused by multiple mutations in the genes that control cell division, ultimately, okay? So normal cells have a very predictable path that they go through. We've talked about this when we talked about the cell cycle. Um, and we know that there are all sorts of checkpoints. The DNA has to be, has to be um, synthesized properly, right? It has to be replicated properly. It has to be split into the new cells properly, all this good stuff, right? you end up having problems in those cycles that override any sort of mechanism that will fix any sort of damage that's been done to the cell. And we'll talk about this more in just a second. Now, the second part of this is that these out of control cells will actually destroy normal cells and tissues that surround them. And this is what causes the problem, right? If you have a malignant tumor, it can spread to other body parts where it does damage there too. These are the metastases. These are the secondary cancers that develop in a new site. The process is called metastasis, and we'll talk about that in just a second as well. But let's review really quickly about DNA replication and then the cell cycle, because this is where you can have problems, right? So you may, in some cases, inherit a mutation that comes from one of your parents that already puts you at risk for cancer, and we will talk about that in just a minute. But let's say that as you're replicating, you end up having a nucleotide in the wrong place. And so it causes problems. You get a mutation, right? Um, how could that happen? Well, we know that when you open up, you unzip your DNA, right? You have to break the weakest of the bonds that are holding all these molecules together. Those are the hydrogen bonds. And which numbers in this picture represent those bonds? So 1 and 2 and 6 and 7 are the covalent bonds of that phosphate backbone, the sugar to the phosphate group, okay? 3 is going to be the sugar to the nitrogenous base, also a covalent bond. 4 and 5 represent those hydrogen bonds between the nucleotides, okay? And this is where we can sometimes get another nucleotide jammed in there, and there you have a point mutation. Okay. Now, these point mutations will cause issues in proteins that govern the cell cycle, right? And your point mutations may cause issues in all kinds of other places, but we're concerned about the ones that cause problems in the proteins that are regulating the cell cycle. So we know we start out here with G1. We've got all kinds of growth factors that are letting us know it's okay to be du duplicated. These are proteins in which you could have problems, right? Then we go to the S phase. You could have poor replication. You could get DNA damage. This would be a problem, right? Then if everything goes well, right, if you do get DNA damage, then the cell should not divide, right? If everything goes well, we know that we move into G2, and then we check it again, right? We repair any mistakes, and if everything goes well, then we can move into mitosis. And hopefully we get two beautiful new little cells, okay? When we start looking about all, when we start looking at all of the things that are happening, there are lots of proteins that are governing all of these things. We have proteins that are saying, okay, yeah, everything's good. I'm growing great. This is happening in G1, right? Um, this is, then we move into the synthesis phase. We have a whole family of proteins called CDKs and cyclins, and they are assisting with the replication. They're making sure everything is going well. They're checking it. Um, they'll initiate repair mechanisms if they need to. Then we move into the G2 phase, um, and we've got some other proteins that are saying, yep, we're, we 
grew well, everything was replicated, including the organelles, they were done too, it's all great, we don't care about that right now, but that is part of it. And um, then we move into mitosis, we've got some more CDKs, they're making sure everything's going well, everything's splitting right, and so you have all of these checkpoints and these factors, right? If you get mistakes in any of these proteins, they may not be able to do their jobs, and their jobs are going to range from um, initiating repair, checking to make sure that you can move to the next phase, right? Um, stopping division. That's a big one. T stopping division. Promoting division, right? Those are all big processes. And just to give you an idea, here's some lists of some of the proteins, specific proteins that are involved, and the cancers that can occur when you have mutations in those particular proteins. Now remember, there are over 200 kinds of cancers, so and we're not talking about each of them specifically. But also remember that you need multiple mutations. So you may see some of these things listed only one time. You need needed more mutations. This is kind of just like the, you know, some of the big ones. And we will talk specifically about some key genes that get mutated in the majority of cancers, right? So what are some of the big um, cancer genes? And we'll talk about those in class. Okay, so we know though that mistakes are made in copies. I mean, we get mistakes. So why doesn't everyone have cancer? Well, it turns out that you actually have built-in DNA repair mechanisms, right? And so anytime there's damage done to the DNA, you have a whole series of repair systems that can range from uh, cutting out insertions to swapping out substitutions, taking the wrong one out and putting the right one in, uh, taking out little sections and replacing them with, with what is supposed to be there instead of the damaged parts, um, cutting out whole big sections and replacing those, and then in if none of those things work, right, then you actually have another set of proteins that's like, nope, couldn't fix it, we're done, and it initiates either G0, which is senescence, and so the cell can continue to function, it just won't ever divide, or it'll actually initiate apoptosis if the cell is damaged uh, badly enough. Okay, so what are the risks, right? What are things that make it more likely that you will get cancer? You've got the behavioral stuff. This is stuff that you do, right? And that includes things like smoking, tanning, right? Stuff that will expose you to damaging agents, right? Then there are just biological characteristics. Um, the older you get, the more likely you are to have cancer. Um, some cancers are sex specific, right? Um, some cancers belong in various, or are more prevalent in various groups, right? Um, for instance, if you are really, really pale, you have a lack of melanin. Melanin helps protect you from UV radiation from the sun. So if you are very, very pale, you are more likely to get skin cancer. So there's an example of a biological characteristic. Now there's also stuff that you get exposed to. Secondhand smoke causes just as much cancer as smoking, right? Radon, chemicals that you're exposed to. And then of course there's that genetic component because I told you earlier that you are likely, more likely to get cancer if you inherit mutations in genes that control any part of this cell cycle component, right? And sometimes you do inherit those. So how does it work exactly, right? How does cancer work, right? So when we talk about cancer, the formation of cancer cells, we're talking about a process called carcinogenesis, right? Carcinogenesis. Um, so you have two factors that are going into the production of these cancer cells, carcinogenesis, right? You've got your environmental agents, these external things that will cause mutations in your cell, and then you have inherited mutations. These are things that are already in your DNA before you ever get exposed to anything else, right? So there's two things that can happen when you have DNA damage, right? So let's just start with the DNA damage part. You get exposed to something, there's DNA damage, you can repair it successfully, or you don't, right? And then you have a failed repair. The inherited mutations can actually help in that failed repair, right? Now. When that happens, you can initiate apoptosis, right? Um, or you can just like 
stop the cell from doing anything. Okay? But if you stop apoptosis, if there's a mutation in the apoptosis signaling proteins, then the cell will not die. Right? If you say stop the genes that stop growth, right? those are called tumor suppressor genes, if you break those then you will get tumors. Right? Sometimes you have proteins that are like, yay, we are going to grow. Yeah? If you activate those permanently, then you will constantly have cell growth. And we'll talk about each of these things in just a second. But ultimately what you end up getting is these abnormal cells. Right? Um, and those are your malignant tumors. So let's look at each of the pieces that you have to do in order to get these, these like bad cells. Okay? Um, first of all, you have to sustain the signal to grow. That is sustaining proliferative signaling. Okay? You have to resist cell death. Right? You have to evade growth suppressors and you have to replicate forever, right? And these are the first four things we're going to talk about. We will also talk about cell proliferation, we will induce angiogenesis, we will avoid your immune system, and then we will invade other, ter other um, places in the body. Okay, so those are the other four things that have to happen. But ultimately you're going to need a mutation essentially to do each of these things. Already right there you have a series of mutations and that doesn't include the four other things that we have to do. Okay, So when we start looking at sustaining um, your signal, right, we just keep saying grow. So what we are doing is we are turning on the growth factors and saying we're gonna grow forever. Yay! Okay? Then, right, we've got these genes that say, um, these are called proto-oncogenes, these were the ones that activate cell growth. Okay? Most of the time they are off. They only turn on when they um, have a, pro like, when they're signaled to turn on, right? And when they're signaled, then, then the protein promoting growth will be produced and the protein will cause cell growth, right? But here's the thing. You can take that gene and if you mutate it, then you can turn that gene on permanently. And so that protein will always be in a confirmation that says go. Right? And so once you do that, you've turned an oncogene on. Right? So oncogenes promote growth. They turn on. They are activated all the time. So the mutation activates the oncogene. So growth is on all the time. Okay? And so when you have a proto-oncogene, right, um, and you need these to actually have cell growth, it just means that they're on all the time. Okay? All right, and then I just put some of these in here so you can kind of see here are the CDKs. And um, we are going to talk about RAS and RAF in class. These are two really important, important proteins. Okay, and we'll talk about those later on. All right, now, okay, the other thing that you can do is you can turn off tumor suppressor genes, right? You can turn off tumor suppressor genes. And RB is a gene that we are going to talk about in class. So remember I told you we were going to do a list of cancer genes. Um, RAS and RB are going to be our two big examples. So RAS will be our oncogene and RB will be our tumor suppressor gene. In this case, right, the tumor suppressor gene when it is on says don't grow. Right? So the oncogene when it is on it says grow. When the tumor suppressor gene is on it says don't grow. Okay, but if you disable your tumor suppressor gene, then there's no, there's nothing that will say don't grow. And so you get tumor formation. Okay, now it turns out that the oncogenes are typically dominant genes. So you only need one mutation in an oncogene to make that happen. Tumor suppressor genes are typically recessive. And so you really only need or so, sorry, so you need both of them, both copies, to be mutated. So you could actually inherit a mutation in a tumor suppressor gene and be fine, right? If you get another mutation in your other one, because remember you have two of each, 
that's when you start having problems. But someone who didn't inherit one has to get two mutations. Someone who inherited a mutation has to only get one mutation. So it's more likely that they will develop uh, cancer. This is what we mean by having a predisposition to getting it. Okay, um, P53 is another one of the genes that we're going to talk about, and P53 uh, regulates DNA damage. And so when P53 is activated, um, then cell division is going to stop because there's too much DNA damage. The DNA repair mechanism comes in, and then P53 is like, you know, okay, it's fine, you can you can grow or not. If the damage is too great, P53 is going to trigger the destruction of the damaged cell, right? If P53 is shut off, you have um, cell growth, uncontrolled cell growth. So P53 and RB are both tumor suppressors. Okay, so let's talk about cell proliferation, all right? What you need here are cancer stem cells. Right. Basically, when we talk about cell pro proliferation, we're talking about having cancerous stem cells. So, and you make them the same way, but these are all these are the stem cells. All right, angiogenesis. You have a bunch of cells that you just made, right? But here's the catch: cells are alive, and you have to feed them. So, angiogenesis is the, is the growth of blood vessels into the tumor. If you never get blood vessels into the tumor, those cells will die, right? But once you get blood vessels growing into the tumor, then it will be fed all the time, okay? And so it's really important for the cancer to sustain itself by having angiogenesis. All right, now metastasis. Not only do you have to have the cells grow, have, you know, not have any function, be damaging the cells around them, um, have blood vessels that feed them, they also have to be able to leave the tumor site, get into the bloodstream, and then travel to a new site where they, they can li then leave the vessel, get into the tissue, and start growing there. Okay, this is a big deal right? They're going to cause problems, tissue death, all sorts of things once they get into that new location. But this is the difference between a benign tumor and a malignant tumor. Okay, the last thing, you have to avoid immune detection. So I've also highlighted resisting cell death here too, right? Because we resisted cell death when we were talking about all that DNA damage, right? Um, but the immune system, when a cell is abnormal, you have this, so you've got the let's just back up a second. You've got the internal signal. Everything has gone horribly wrong within the cell. Let's destroy it. Okay, that's the internal signal. Okay, but the cancer cells are not like regular cells. And so you have to also look at them from this external environment. The immune system, right, the cells in the immune system are going around and, and they're making sure that everything is okay. It's all your stuff. It's very exciting. Um, and Typically, it would see a cancer cell and say, whoa, whoa, that's not right. And you'll get an external apto uh, apoptosis signal, okay? But cancer cells avoid being detected by the immune system, and so they avoid that external apoptosis um, Q2, okay? Um, and so we know that when you have program cell death, right? Um, the cell will essentially implode and dissolve, right? But when you have a cancer cell, it hides essentially from the immune system. And so the immune system never picks it up, never gives the signal. All right, so here's your next question. Potential cancer therapies are being developed to target all of the following. Inhibiting the growth inducing RAS protein, blocking enzymes that allow cells to pass through vessel walls, inhibiting the growth of new blood vessels, blocking external signals that continue tumor growth, or transplanting healthy cells from a donor to replace cancer cells. All of these other things, A through D, are great, right? And they're things that we're all doing. Transplanting healthy cells from a donor to replace the cancer cells, not so great because the donor cells don't belong to the individual. And so the immune system is going to attack those. Having said that, though, one of the things that we're starting to do is 
take out cells from an individual, and this is called gene therapy, and then you replace all of the bad genes through genetic engineering, and then you take these healthy cells from the patient and try and replace the cancer cells. So that's something that we can do, but having healthy cells from a donor, that's not really going to work very well for cancer. It can work for other things, but it can't really work for cancer. Okay, so on that note, there is lots of research that's being done in how to prevent and how to treat cancer. Um, and so over time, we've actually seen millions of cancer deaths being avoided right? Um, and in some cases it's because the treatment is so much better. In some cases it's because cases are actually avoided entirely. Um, but when you're looking at these graphs in particular, we're talking about uh, treatments, right? And so cancer is a huge problem, right? Uh, at least one in five of the most common cancers globally can actually be prevented simply by behavior. Okay, um, so there are lots of things that can be done around the world, but about 8 million people every year die from cancer. Okay, and so it is still a huge, huge issue um, globally, right? Although in developing nations, uh, we see much more risk from communicable diseases than we do from cancers, but as communicable diseases start um, being more under control in developing nations, then deaths will be more from cancer, right? Because that is sort of the deal. Um, when we start looking at the 2017 estimates, for instance, you can see that sex-specific cancers um, were really the, the big problem here in the United States, but then quickly following that are going to be your lung cancers, although that is way down, that is way down from what it used to be. And this comes from simply not smoking. But here's just like a little breakdown. And the reason that I put this chart in here, um, this, this data, is so you can see that lots of cancers are actually more survivable than they used to be, right? And so if you look at here, lung cancer is only 12% of the new cases for females, but it was responsible for 25% of the deaths, while 30% of new cases for females are breast cancer, but only 14% of death, right? And so that kind of shows you that breast cancer is more treatable, right, than lung cancer, okay? Um, ultimately, what is the most avoidable type of cancer? Well, Skin cancer, lung cancer, and cervical cancer actually are all avoidable, right? Cervical cancer is avoidable uh, by getting things like the vaccine for HPV um, because it is transmitted by a virus, yes? Lung cancer related to not smoking. The most avoidable type of cancer, though, happens to be skin cancer, right? Because exposure to the sun is the main cause of skin cancer and one in six Americans will have skin cancer, and it makes it in some ways the kind of the most common cancer, but it's really, um, really preventable. It's also really treatable. If you catch it early, you can actually have it removed. But prevention is really the key. So you avoid prolonged exposure to the sun. You plan your activities so you're not in the sun when it's at the peak, right? You use sunscreen, you don't tan, you know, you wear appropriate clothing, and you get screened if you think that you are at risk, okay? Now, having said that, lung cancer, also really, really preventable. Lung cancer, um, actually causes more deaths than any other cancer. And the number one cause, of course, is smoking. Smoking, smoking, smoking. Now, the reason, though, that it's not like the most preventable type of cancer is because air pollution, radon, environmental factors, genetics also play a role in your likelihood to get lung cancer. So there's some other factors involved, but smoking is a huge deal, right? So really taking anything not like air into your lungs 
affects your lungs. But point being, though, is that smoking, 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 smoking is is really a problem. And as people have stopped smoking, um, the rates of lung cancer have gone down, right? And just to give you a sense of what we're looking at, this is a beautiful, healthy lung um, in an 83-year-old male, right? You have this nice pink tissue, and it's great, and you have all this, you know, lovely healthy, plump lung stuff. This is actually what lung cancer looks like and you have this discoloration and the black from the uh, tar and all sorts of things that are actually in the um, cigarettes themselves, but this is the diseased tissue. And you can see all these tumors here and this does not look lovely and healthy like this. It's not good. Okay. So that is it for cancer. If you have any questions, please ask me in class and we will discuss the genes contr that contribute to cancer um, more in class. And thanks for listening. I will see you next time.